Hello on this beautiful May morning. I'm Alison McGrath and I've been sharing my garden on the Tired Gardener website for a year now. Now we're in lockdown. Like a lot of other people, I've been pushed into doing things I've never tried before, including making videos. And I thought that I would share with you something of my garden and the joy that it brings to me. Um, one of the things that I love to do most is just to wander around and see what's happening, what's what's growing. And I particularly like to do that of an evening, what I call blackbird time. Um, just after the sun's gone down when the blackbirds are singing. And my husband and I will go around and often look at the things that, that I've done during the day. It's going to be very much a warts and all tour. Um, I hope I'll come back to it regularly to, to show you what, what's changing over the seasons. Um, but I am somebody who is recovering from fibromyalgia. I've been a, I am a passionate gardener. Um, it's a garden that I've developed over the last 15 years since we moved into this house. And at times it's been incredibly frustrating to see all the work that I've done disappearing under mounds and mounds of weeds and jobs not done, things left lying around because I was exhausted. Um, so what I'm learning to do is to, to look at the little things, the things that are going right, and to appreciate and stop and spend time looking at it. So now I'm going to share that with you. I hope you enjoy it. I'm going to start with the, the front of the garden where you first come in the gate and this little bed under the kitchen window which gets almost no rain because it's in the shadow of the porch um, but at the moment it's full of wallflowers that I grew from seed last year and the beautiful Welsh poppies um, which I got seed from my mum. I threw it around for years before it actually took and now they are absolutely everywhere. You might be able to hear in the background my chickens. Every time I appear, they think I'm going to feed them, so they're calling out to me for some food. And in the corner here is my teasing Georgia rose. It's one of David Austin's, um, and it is coming with buds. For me, one of the great joys of gardening is waiting. The anticipation when you see that first colour appearing is absolutely wonderful. Since they've already introduced themselves, I'll show you my chickens, named by my daughter. The grey one's called Mulligan and the white one is Lafayette. Um, she'd just been to see Hamilton. And the black one, rather grandly, is called Raven Mystique because she's a big science fiction fan. They have a second-hand Egglu which I bought online from EJ, eBay, which has uh, been a great, great buy. It's easy to clean. If you're wondering why there's all this netting, Mulligan has a very bad tendency to try and escape and go into the neighbours' gardens. I'll start with what I call my secret garden, probably because it's the bit that's looking best at the moment. Um, when we moved into this house, this area, this little front garden, was just grass and a hypericum bush under the window. Um, very, very boring. And I had a dream that I could turn it into somewhere where I could sit in the summer and it would be full of scent. Um, so we're back to the, uh, this is the point at which I'm waiting for all sorts of things to burst into bloom. So this is my climbing, my clematis, Cezanne, with a self-seeded aquilegia coming up through the middle of it. They're absolutely everywhere. Rather beautiful though. And coming through the gate, more of the Welsh poppies and a very lush border. I tend to let most things that are pretty grow in this border because it's up against the privet hedge. Um, and so I think if they're happy and they look nice, I will leave them well alone. I have a, a plum tree, which for the first time in its life seems to have a large crop coming at the moment. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed um, that we will get plenty of plums from those later in the year. And earlier in the year, this was all full of hyacinths, um, daffodils, all sorts of things. I'll take you around the corner in a minute. Under the window is my very small rose garden. Peonies, also ready to burst, but at the back there, we're on the 7th of May, and we already have a rose which has been in bloom for over a week now. This is Gertrude Jekyll, which has the most beautiful scent. the lushness of the new rose leaves. They're so soft and tinged with red. And this is uh, an allium. I did put foxgloves in this bed when we first moved in and they went beautifully with the purple of these alliums but the foxgloves are thugs and they took over. I had to get rid of them. 
take out all the seedlings that followed for a couple of years. Oh, and this is smudge, or it was smudge. More peonies, and this is the area where I like to sit. It's absolutely glorious of a summer evening. I come out here with a glass of wine or something and listen to the blackbirds, watch the house martins and the swifts and swallows go overhead until the sun's gone down far enough for them to disappear. Um, and then in the past we've had bats. I haven't seen them for a couple of years. I do hope they come back again. So around the corner a little bit further. This wall was completely blank when we moved in and it was a real heat trap. It was very unpleasant to be here in the, in the hot sun because it faces full west, this little corner. So I've grown honeysuckle and jasmine up. It needs trimming back every year to stop it going through the roof. But with the roses, it is a wonderful, wonderful place to sit in the summer with all the scent. And then my little washing up basin pond so there's a little source of water and it's nice to sit on this bench sometimes and just look down into the water and see it teeming with life. I have a new clematis coming up the back there so again that's anticipation for when that appears and these are my giant lilies which grow up through the growth of the honeysuckle and by complete serendipity they match the colours of the honeysuckle sort of cream and yellow and red so I hope I'll be able to show them to you later in the year. And the water butt. Water butt's everywhere. This lovely big viburnum bush which needs to be pruned. Now it's just finished flowering was a gift from my husband's aunt. I love to have plants which remind me of people and places. You can walk around and, and relive so much. My hellebores. Ah, now if you're wondering what that is, it's called the waspinator. I bought it from Barnsdale Gardens. It's essentially a bag full of plastic bags. It's supposed to persuade wasps that somebody already nesting here so that they shouldn't bother. I'm not sure whether it works. I'll let you know. And then down here, hellebores and pulmonaria, which the bees love and have these glorious spotted leaves. Pulmonaria um, named for its appearance um, like the, the lungs, the human lungs sort of blotchy appearance that comes from what was known as the doctrine of signatures where people believed that you could use a plant medicinally for um, whatever it appeared to look like so you'd use these for lung complaints Ah, oh, here we have smudge again sitting under a rose called deep secret it's the most beautiful deep deep red apple scented rose when it comes but at the moment it has these fabulous new soft red leaves So that's my secret garden. Turn the corner and it's a warts and all because there is the rather ratty old gate which is um, needs to go to the tip. Of course at the moment we can't do that. Well I did say warts and all. So this is a screen that I've planted to try and hide the bin area. Uh, Magnolia stellata which reminds me of a weekend my husband and I had away in Prague where we sat in a cafe um, surrounded by potted Magnolia stellata. It was beautiful, beautiful scent and a rose called Happy Child, which my mother gave me when my son was born and she became a grandmother. So this is the warts bit. Not very nice, but one of the more exciting bits for me, this is my hot bin, um, in which we put all our kitchen scraps and it keeps things at a very high temperature so they compost very quickly and you can put cooked scraps and things in as well. And then turning round, that's the rake I used to rake out the gravel and the chickens. Philadelphus and I have always, since I was a small child for some reason, wanted an orchard with chickens. So these are my three little apple trees. Uh, Discovery on the left, the russet apple in front and then behind beautiful beauty of bath and they've passed their best now but the blossom on these has been absolutely phenomenal this year so I'm very very hopeful. That's discovery. It's a rather grand title for a very small area of the garden but it's the orchard and the chickens are next to it not under it because I did try them underneath the trees they just destroyed all the grass and pulled everything out. They are incredibly destructive animals. More warts. We aren't on mains gas here and more water butts but I've grown a rose called Gardener's Delight up this big north-facing wall 
which has beautifully scented pink flowers later on in the summer and rather wonky where I've used a pole that I happen to have uh, not very pretty hence the rope up the side I'm going to try and get something to grow up it north facing walls are really difficult places to grow in um, so I use the same principle here that if something likes this place self seeds and looks all right I leave it alone so I have a self seeded lemon balm on the right here and then there is a geranium which will be a deep deep purple that my mother gave me and it lives here on this north facing wall all the time even through the coldest of winters it survived which really surprises me my trimmed box bushes that's a nod to my mother's garden. Her house has two big round box bushes that must be 150 years old now. So now I've got my own and they will have a bit of a trim soon. More self-seeded aquilegia coming up through the middle of lavender. Looking back towards the apple trees again and smudges back in the shot. This area used to be a sand pit for my daughter. Um, and when she got fed up of it we turned it into a little garden which she barely used and when I said to her that she needed to do some weeding she said it's my garden and I'm going to delegate that you can do it so I took it back and it's now a little salad garden um, which really keeps us going very very well you can see at the back the tall that's um, a, a sorrel which is a relative of the dock plant that's in bolted and going to seed at the moment but if I cut those big flowers down it will spray, sprout again in the bottom and then there is a, a red-leafed sorrel, parsley. I planted some little lettuces in here as well. Essentially anything to keep us going in greens in the coming months. Um, quite worrying to know what we're going to get with the problems that Spain's been having, um, like our own with coronavirus, and that they produce vast amount, a vast proportion of our green vegetables. Behind the, the salad gardens is this quite tall three-pronged potted um, gooseberry. This is one I took as a cutting when I did a, a training day in Wrighton Gardens once. It's called Black Velvet. It really needs potting on some, sometime soon. But I've trained it to be three long tall stems that can go against a, a fence which makes it much much easier to pick them. And this rather more rampant bush. That's a jostaberry, which is a cross between a blackcurrant and a gooseberry, I think. That was taken as a cutting from a, a friend's garden. One of the things that really drives me most nuts about this garden, it's a very long, thin triangle, and it has this big Leylandii hedge. It's very tall, which just sucks all the goodness out, so we need to do quite a lot of watering. Um, and it's been a struggle to find things that will grow at the base of it. So you'll notice there are lots of iris leaves there. They love being on the south facing dry slope. And this is a creeping rosemary at the bottom. I have roses in here, which do mean that I have to keep sloshing all the washing up water on them regularly to keep them going. And bluebells. I love bluebells in a bluebell wood, but they're not supposed to be here. And it's a big job every year to remove all the bulb leaves. There's also in there crocuses and little narcissi and snake's head fritillaries and you can see the remnants there of crown imperial so it'll be another year before i can show you those but they're glorious and this is my hyssop plant just leaning forward over the wall there more bluebells not such a problem there but i will rip them out a lot this year so that they don't get too excited you can just see the coal frames behind and in the foreground you've just missed my what i call my slovenian tulips i went on a work trip to slovenia and was given some tulip bulbs when we visited the uh, arboretum in ljubljana and they've come back every year this sort of creamy apricot with pink stripes like a raspberry ripple beautiful my herbs just outside the garden sage the rosemary whose blossom has been stunning this year, absolutely beautiful, and the bees go crazy for it. French tarragon. You might wonder what these little white packets are. This is maybe one of my bonkers ideas. We ordered meat yesterday and it came with huge amounts of packaging. Um, these little plastic packets full of frozen water. 
So I've put one of them in each of my um, containers on the patio and bodged a hole in it so that it can leach out slowly and, and water them. So later today, if that is a job I am going to do, I'm going to collect them all up before they blow away. And this is a tea tree bush. It's a bit sad at the moment, it will come back later in the year. Beautiful bright green feathery, I think it's Australian. I took uh, leaves from it last year, dried them and made them into bath salts for my husband who loves it. Uh, fence post just before lockdown. Somebody was going to come and mend our fence for us. So somewhere there is a bag of cement as well which is waiting for him to be able to come back. That's the patio. Veg bed raised to the left by the greenhouse. And talk about that in a little while. Oil tank. And the boiler shed, very boring, all that kind of stuff. Let's get back to the plants. I just put out my hanging baskets, which have tumbling tom tomatoes in, so hopefully we'll get a, a good crop from those this year. A self-seeded white buddleia, which was rather beautiful, appeared in a pot with something else, so I've kept it and I'm going to take it to our community allotment at some point. And then hostas. This is, it has to be said, a pretty ugly house. It's a big brick box, it's not what I would have wanted, so I've tried to mask the back of it with the pots and things, so geraniums and erigium. I'll come back to those later when they've got something worth looking at, but a little gem down here. Lily of the Valley. That's the scent that reminds me of my grandmother. Down the side of the veg bed I've got my strawberries that gradually disintegrates into almost no soil at the far end. So I've got some alpines there, this needs some serious work. And you'll just be able to see there my other cat, Nala. Poor old lady's rather poorly but she loves to sunshine to sunbathe. Not a beautiful area by the back door, but it will be much nicer later. This is my new hose pipe. I got sick and tired of the plastic hose lock. So I've invested on one that uh, expands and has got nice brass fittings. I get excited by some strange things. More little water packs, white lilies. Um, I think what's interesting here is the self-seeded phacelia which has popped up. Lovely feathery leaves and later in the year it will have blue flowers which you can also use as a, a green manure and the bees go crazy for that. Coming up the arch into the top garden. Oh, we have split level gardens, that sounds very posh, doesn't it? As you can see, it's a very long, thin triangle, all sorts of things scattered all over the lawn. And the blackbirds have been pulling the soil out from the veg bed. If I turn around to the left here, you can see the back of my bay tree, also something that needs hacking back every year. And these are my original blueberries, the one on the left is going to have to go, it's got too old and it's dying back. But I've got new ones to replace them. And the thyme's just coming into bloom looking over towards the, the coal frames, past the quince tree. Um, the bottles are full of beer. I got these from my local pub. It's the slops when they run through the pipes and I'm going to use that for slug traps. This is one of the bits I worked on earlier this year, a little bit at a time to clear it all. Um, the bigger plants to the left, that's garlic, which I planted back at the end of October. And then to the right, I have onions, which went a little bit later, I think. I wasn't sure if they were going to come through, but they did. And at the bottom, Grandpa's Crest. It's a land crest, which was given me by Sally Cunningham, I think, a friend at Garden Organic. And coming around that way, that area is ready to plant out my beans when they come through. Courgettes, sweet corn, all that sort of thing. And coming around, this is one of the plants that pops up every year in this garden is borage. I planted some from seed when we first moved in and it's seeds everywhere. So I just pull out the ones I don't want, put them in the compost um, as you can see hopefully here. It's absolutely adored by bees and it has the most exquisite little blue flowers which are really nice. They're edible so you float them in a, a glass of water or something or put them on a, on a salad. They look wonderful. And behind are my globe artichokes. They come back year after year. I'm trying to move more towards perennials now. They require an awful lot less work. So if you notice there's 
Ah, there's a lot of seeds coming through here. This is another job soon. Um, I've mulched this bed so that I don't have to do quite so much weeding. And this strange frame on the top is an old, small greenhouse frame. Um, the plastic kept ripping and blowing away, so I put it on the side now, and when I put my brassicas in here, I'm going to cover it with netting, so it's a frame that just holds everything up, really. More artichoke oaks and rhubarb at the back. That's a very shady corner, and the rhubarb's about the only thing that goes that has in my perennial bed. Put in some Jerusalem artichokes. Those will grow very tall. They look a bit like sunflowers, um, and they have a beautiful, tasty root which has unfortunate effects to your insides. This is my African kale. This is another thing that came from Wrighton Gardens. Um, you just pick off the leaves as you go and it's very hardy. Manages through the winter so every year I just take a piece of the growing points, stick it in a pot and grow on a new one. Like the one at the base here. It's a new plant to replace for next year. If you're all being well, we'll have greens in the winter as well as through the summer with the salads. Strawberry flowers coming. And coming this way is a saxifrage. Something that really does go well in an area where there's not much soil. London Pride, a giant dandelion. And in the corner, another uninvited resident of this garden, but very beautiful violets which just pop up absolutely everywhere. Another plant that self-seeds everywhere is alpine strawberries and one of the fun things with us is just to rustle through the leaves and find the berries all the way through the summer. Tiny and really delicious underneath the fennel. My greenhouse. This is a very special place for me. Um, I didn't have much choice where to put it. There were really many alternatives in the garden so it's up against the wall on the shadier side of the garden not ideal but my dad helped me to source it and to bring it back from the, the man who sold it to us and to put down the slabs that it's on um, so full of memories of, of him and at the moment it's absolutely packed I've planted out some of the tomatoes in these big tubs and I've got lots more that I'm going to pass on to the neighbours chilies spider plants I don't know why I took my baby spider plant cuttings because now I don't need any more but they're there anyway chilies seedlings of spinach and beetroot i did like to grow unusual things and this came from working at garden organic i've got access to all sorts of stuff so this is an ochre which is a south american tuber and in the corner here i have pomegranate plant which i grew from a pomegranate pip and again that was after doing a training day courgettes very light chilies and some cuttings from one of my mum's vinca plants, which is very beautiful. And parsnips. This is a Vietnamese coriander, again, from Brighton Gardens. I'm not working there anymore, so I have to look after this with great care to make sure I don't lose it. It's very easy to take cuttings, so I keep taking cuttings, I've got more plants. Um, this is very tender, it's out in the greenhouse at the moment, but during the winter it's, it's in the house. Lots and lots of stuff stored in here. I don't have a great deal of storage, so I have to have shelves packed with all sorts of things. More warts and all. Somewhere to keep my bamboos. This is um, a bee nuke. I started learning to do beekeeping a couple of years ago, and this is for bringing on a new colony. And this is my other little... Um, washing up basin garden and I put an old ridge tile next, next to it which is sort of a, a haven for hedgehogs or frogs or anything else that, that needs it. This is a bit of a nightmare corner where I get a lot of twitch coming in from next door's garden so I've just cleared that out last week. It was very satisfying I'll, evening on my hands and knees just nose down in the soil. Tony Astor was a gift from my mother so growing from seed. Badlia and a self-seeded Solomon seal. That's rather a lovely plant as well. And cuckoo pint behind. I don't know if that was planted by somebody before or if it's just from the wild because there's a lot of it around here. Probably from when this was just a, a field. That's the Buddleia, which will have huge white flowers later in the year. Pots which will have flowers. 
and the disconnected water pipe which burst one winter and we discovered that this spur to the garden had been put in illegally by somebody so we're still waiting to actually work out how we can remove that and these are my current bushes which again you can see I've grown as a screen um, up straight and in trident shapes it makes them much much easier to pick so at the front here we have a red current they look like little clusters of grapes they're just beginning to swell now and then to the right I've got two gooseberry bushes there again the fruit is just beginning to swell you can see that yeah Again, the bees really, really love these plants. This is the compost area, the engine of the garden. So coming past the currant bushes and some more Solomon seal. This is the big mature plant that must have set the seeds for the other one. Um, behind the bird feeder. I've only got the seed at the moment, no fat balls for them, I'm afraid, with lockdown. This is my other apple tree, which is a Blenheim orange. This is one that friends grow in their garden. I loved it so much. I wanted to put one in mine. And then in the corner here, past the bird seed, this is my comfrey patch. Comfrey is a fantastic plant. The leaves, if you soak them in water, make a really good all-round plant feed for nothing. And they have these lovely, lovely flowers. And again, that's a good one for the bees. This is a variety called Bocking 14. For anybody who knows a bit about these things, it was developed at Wright and Gardens by Garden Organic. It was part of the foundation of why Garden Organic was set up it was on research into plant nutrition and comfrey and Bocking 14 doesn't set seed so it doesn't spread everywhere. That's my leaf mould pile sitting in the, uh, the netting, rotting down, good soil improver and I use it for seed compost and my Dalek compost bins at the back. My conch compost turner, which is like a big corkscrew. There, you can see it better now. You turn the handle and it goes down into the compost and you pull it up. That is a flipping hard job which I haven't been able to do for several years and my husband's taken on but now I can begin to do it again. I'm getting stronger, more rhubarb and the raspberries. This is a bed that was in a real mess until last week. Um, I've cleared out all of the weeds. I've repaired the posts that support the raspberries. Uh, there was a rat run, went right underneath all the raspberries and they were doing very badly for a while, so hopefully we sorted that out too. We don't put kitchen scraps in any of the compost now, not even the veg peelings. And to the shed. Little insect house, given to us by my mother-in-law, and red mason bees have just started moving into that. There's a red mason bee just coming in now, into one of these little tubes where it's, they're going to lay an egg and then they fill the end up with mud. Um, you can see just there, a mason bee is worth 120 honeybees as a pollinator. Very hard working little creatures. Water bins, recycled old bin turned into a water butt. Um, these are beds made of pallet collars. Um, and I've planted them up with broad beans, which were put in in October. Uh, and are uh, in full flower now. More bee magnets. And at the base, you can just see coriander coming. I didn't tend to reuse a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> this is a very odd looking bed. At the back of it is a big sheet of glass that I salvaged from our village shop when they threw it out. Um, and the bed is covered with the top of our old guinea pig cage. Unfortunately, they died this year, which means that the lawn is much, much nicer. But don't tell my daughter that. And there are carrots in here. And I'm not sure why that's sitting on the top. That is an old lid from a fire pit, which I think could go now. I've stopped growing in tyres, so I'm waiting to get rid of those as well. And that's the remnants of the um, roofing felt in the shed. Unfortunately, my bee colony died over last winter, um, being a novice. They managed to starve because I did the wrong thing, so I'm going to try a new colony this year. Um, this one's sitting waiting to go back to the place where it lives in my mum's garden. Uh, and it's using, being used as a stand for my little trays of flower seedlings, which is Lobelia and Alisum and Facelia. The last part of this tour now 
this bed started life as a frame that was on top of a hotbed. Um, I started with a great enthusiasm building this, but you have to burrow enough manure to fill a square that's six feet across, six feet by six feet, which is a huge amount. And it was just as I was beginning to get ill and I had to give up. So now we just have this filled with the soil and I've, it's full of salads, um, spinach coming, lettuce, pea shoots, uh, radishes, all sorts of things. And I have peas in these buckets. These are self-watering buckets. So um, I'll post something on the website about how to do those. But essentially it's a, a double layer with a brick between them. Holes in the top one. So that the uh, roots can reach down into the water reservoir underneath. And irises that came from my mother. These ones are getting close to popping. And they're beautiful apricot colour with a red beard. And they smell of apricots. And that's more or less it, really. I'll take you down a panorama and you can see it in all its messy glory. With the hammock. I'm trying to get the kids to come out in the hammock. Sometimes successful in the back of our rather hodgepodge of a house. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I'd like to come back to it as the seasons progress and show you it again. Uh, something different every day, but I can't promise to do a video that often.